if it doesn't at, uh, affect the red nucleus. So the red nucleus is intact. But fibers from the cortex are lost. The fibers from the basal ganglia are also lost. What happens? So we expect all limbs to be extended. Right? Like this one. But the thing that happens is that arms are flexed. Why? Because the red nucleus is now not under the control of the cortex. So it's working on control. Okay? So we have extension, just similar to extension that we had in the decerebrate posture. But this extension is actually is combined with collection of the arm, only arm. Because red nucleus in humans only innervate arms. Rubro spinal tract doesn't go to the legs in humans. Okay? So extension in the leg is the result of activity in the pontine reticular spinal tract and also the vestibular one. Right? And the lack of the medullary reticular spinal tract function. But flexion in the arm is caused by uncontrolled activity of the red nucleus. So rubrous spinal tract is responsible for this flexion. Right? So we call this decorticate the posture. So in the decorticate posture, red nucleus is intact. But in the decerebrate posture, red nucleus is lost. Because red nucleus is upper than the, the damage, okay? So it's not connected with the lower part of the body. Okay? So, now let's talk about the motor cord. So we have seen the function, the motor function of the spinal cord and the brain. Right? We go on with the motor cord. Several areas in the cortex are related to the movement. All of them are in the frontal cortex. So anterior to the central fissure. Sorry. Yeah? Anterior to the central fissure. Behind the fissure, we have somatosensory area of one, somatosensory association of areas. Anterior to the fissure, we have broadband area of four, broadband area of six. Broadman area of four is for primary motor cortex. Broadman area of six is supplementary and pre-motor cortex. Right? So primary motor cortex M1, pre-motor cortex PM, supplementary motor area SMA. Three regions involved in voluntary movement or purposeful movements. Right? Okay. In each of these areas, we have a map of the body, just similar to the somatosensory area one. You can see here, the legs are represented in the medial side between the hemispheres, and the face is represented on the laterals. Right? We have also the same map in the premotor and supplementary motor area. But these maps are not that precise, are not as precise as that of the uh, primary motor cortex, right? So, again, like the somatosensory area of one, most of the cortical area for movement is dedicated to the face and hand, right? So we have a large area for movement in the face, a large cortical area for movements in the hand, and a small critical area for the rest of the way. Front and left. This means movements in the fingers and in the face are more or very more important for us, for humans. We do everything in our life with hands. Right? So that's why we have a very large critical area for movements of the hands and also for face. For face, we need movement for speaking, right? For language, and also for facial expression. So these are very important movements in humans. So 
activation of a neuron in the primary motor cortex causes overt movements, I mean contraction of the muscles that can be seen even. Okay? But the thing is that the connection is not by one by one. I mean, activation of a neuron doesn't necessarily cause contraction of one muscle. I mean, neurons in the primary motor cortex do not contract with muscles. I mean, with special muscles. But they are dealing with specific movements. For example, you may have this movement or this movement a very simple movement, right? So this movement may occur by the action of several muscles, not only one muscle, right? So neurons in the brain do not have one by one connections with each of these muscles, okay? They are actually collectively connected with all muscles involved in this movement. So the movement is important, not the muscle, right? So, excitation of a single neuron in N1 usually excites a specific movement, not a contraction of a muscle. For movement, you may need more than one muscle, right? And all of these muscles are activated by a neuron, okay? So, primary motor cortex and premotor and supplementary motor areas are connected with the muscles by way of the corticospinal tract. You know the, the tract, right? So, fibers from motor cortex, 30%, 30% of the fibers are coming from the premotor and supplementary motor area, 40% from somatosensory area all of them, right? So, these fibers generate corticospinal tract. They go down to the pons, through the midbrain, pons, and medulla. In the medulla, they cross. 80% of the fibers cross here. They generate lateral corticospinal tract. 20% doesn't cross, do not cross. They generate ventral corticospinal tract. This one was in lateral system, this one in the ventral system, remember? From the beginning of the session. Right? Then they go to the spinal cord. They make contact with interneurons or directly with anterior motor neurons in different areas of the ventral wall. Right? In the ventral wall, lateral motor neurons are activated by lateral corticospinal tract. Medial anterior motor neurons are activated by ventral corticospinal tract. And other fibers that come from parietal cortex, I told you that 40% of the fibers coming from parietal cortex, right? They interact with sensory neurons in the dorsal horn of the, of the spinal cord. Okay, so the lateral corticospinal tract is more important for fine control of distal muscles, like for fingers and wrist movements, but ventral corticospinal tract is most important for postural movements, right, controlled by supplementary motor area. So they interact with proximal muscles of the limbs. Another pathway from the cortex to the spinal cord is the rupert spinal tract. So we have fibers from the cortex that go to the retinal place. And it brain. It has two portions. Parvocellular, <coughs> upward, macrocellular, downward. Right? So the fibers interact with macrocellular portion in the inferior side. Then they cause, actually, they generate rubro spinal tract. So we have cortico, rubro spinal tract. Right? 
you have also cross of fibers from the wrist nucleus. After the wrist nucleus, neurons go to the opposite side and then go down. So, the left side of the cortex activates the right supraspinal channel. And the left side, the right side activates the left rubrospinal tract. Okay? So the relation between the cortex and the rubrospinal tract is contralateral. Okay? This pathway also terminates on lateral group of interneurons. So they contract the distal muscles, the ingerd and the wrist. But the thing is that Red nucleus is not so precise for the control of the distal muscles. Okay? Usually activation of the rubrospinal tract causes gross movements, like grasping. And this grasping is sometimes bilateral. Okay? But corticospinal tract can precisely control movements in the fingers. So you can, for example, do this. Or do this. Okay? So you can separate the move your fingers. This is controlled by the cortex. By the rubrospinal tract, you cannot do this. You can only do this or this. Okay? So if there is a damage in the corticospinal tract, like this, or in the motor cortex, after the recovery, most of the functions come back. For example, movement of the legs, the trunk, the neck. Okay? You can voluntarily move your body. You can voluntarily move your arm, your elbow, your wrist. But usually, uh, movements of the fingers are not returned. Do not return. Right? So, you can move your fingers. I mean, the patient can move the finger. But only grossly because of the action of the rubrous spinal tract. So the cortex cannot separately control the fingers because the cortex was lost actually, right? But rubrous spinal tract can still do grasping movements, I mean gross finger movements. So this patient may not be able to play piano, may not be able to work precisely, okay? Or, for example, may have problem with scissoring, okay? So these are some precise movements. They can only be controlled by the cortex. And if there is a loss of the cortex, the rubrospinal tract cannot do these precise movements. But the rubrospinal tract is a parallel pathway for controlling the distal part of the brain. The other thing that I should mention is that these two pathways usually deal with flexors. Right? Extensors are generally controlled by uh, brainstem pathway, reticular, vestibular, and those pathways. Flexor muscles can only be activated by rubrospinal and corticospinal pathways. A stimulation in the motor cortex causes contraction of a few muscles. We call them discrete. Stronger and longer stimulation causes coordinated movements of multiple muscle groups, or let's say complex movement. So complex movement is a movement that involves several joints. But simple movement or discrete movement is a type of movement that only involves one joint. Mm -hmm. So this movement is a simple movement. But this movement is a complex movement because it involves shoulder, elbow, wrist, fingers. Right? So we call this complex movement. So, primary motor cortex is able to do both discrete movements and complex movements. Right? Neurons in the primary motor cortex determine the force of muscle contraction, the length of the muscle, the number of muscles that are activated, the pattern of the muscle activity, joint displacement, force, and the trajectory of the movement or the direction of the movement. Okay? So, movement to any direction is controlled by primary. Movement by any force, mild, or severe or strong is controlled by primary motor cortex. So direction, force of the movement, anything. 
is controlled by primary motor areas. But supplementary motor area is very important for complex movements and positional movements. Okay? Stimulation in the supplementary motor area causes more complex and bilateral movements, like bilateral thoracic. So, stimulation only the right side in the supplementary motor area activates both parts. Right? right? So it's not contralateral. It's bilateral. Another type of movement, vocalization. Stimulation in this area causes speaking. So for the speaking beneath the supplementary motor area, in some patients that have damage to the supplementary motor area, speaking is completely lost. The patient cannot initiate anything to speak. Okay? So for vocalization, for the start of the speaking, we need supplementary motor area. Complex postural movements. So I told you that posture is controlled by reticular formation, vestibular formation. But all of those pathways are under the control of the supplementary motor area. When you voluntarily sit down, or when you purposefully lie down, or you stand up. So you are changing the posture. The posture is controlled by the brain stem circuit. But you do this voluntarily. You do this purposefully. I mean, by a free will, you do this. OK? So this is done by supplementary motor area. So those pathways in the brain stem are under the control of the supplementary motor area. Another one is sequence of movements. Okay? So, I also have this here. Organizing and planning of motor sequence. What does it mean, sequence? Example. So, turning on your radio. Okay? So, first of all, you should do a reaching movement. For this reaching. Right? Then you should hold the button. Then you should press. Then you should tear. Right? So you actually you perform four different movements in succession: reaching, holding, pressing, tearing. This is a sequence of movement. This sequence is controlled by supplementary. Right? So. Any movement that involves sequence of action is controlled by supplementary movement. Another one is the bodyweight attitudinal movement, fixation movement, positional movement. Positional movement of the body. So, example, drawing or painting. Okay, when you paint, you are moving your wrist and fingers. But it doesn't mean that you are not using the shoulder and elbow. Shoulders, I mean muscles that control the shoulder contract, muscles that control the elbow also contract, but they keep them fixed. Right? So they provide a background for movement of the wrist. This part is controlled by the supplementary motor area. This part is controlled by primary movement. So, fixation movement is controlled by supplementary movement. Attitudinal movement, which is a type of postural movement. Like, you want to play ping pong? Okay? You are waiting for the ball. And when it comes to you, you actually you have a backhand. Backhand? Okay. So, before the backhand, you pose this position. Okay? 